is uh, Nicholas Bulins. I'm the program administrator for the Massachusetts Stretching Program. So I'm going to be going through the info session. Uh, thanks for coming in. I know it was a hike for a number of you, and we appreciate that. Uh, as Juan said, we are recording this. Luckily, it's just me being recorded, so you guys are spared that. Not that I like being recorded, but recognize that this was a hike for a lot of people. Um, we wanted to make sure it would be accessible for everyone. So it will be posted on the website, along with all the Q&A and the answers that we provide. Um, we're accepting written questions as well, and I'll get into that. So I'll try to go through um, quickly as possible, leave room for questions at the end. So this is our agenda. It basically follows the RFP. So my goal today is kind of to walk you through the RFP, provide the information, hopefully in a digestible way. Then we'll go through some of the mechanics of applying because we couldn't get a completely electronic version of applying. So there's a lot of filling a form, uploading it, stuff like that. So I want to go through the mechanics with you. And then some helpful tips, reminders to think about as you're going through your application, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So some background, which uh, Assistant Secretary Vega already did. This is really the first program of its kind in the Commonwealth. It's the first standalone program to offer focus funding for dredging, and it offers that funding on an annual competitive basis. So in the past, there were some older programs that made funding available for dredging, but they weren't available on a regular recurring basis. They weren't necessarily competitive. They didn't focus on dredging, and they weren't necessarily for all communities. So um, this program is hopefully adding some sanity to that process. <laughs> so before, a lot of the times, the only real state funding was through earmarks, which wasn't the most predictable source of funding. So hopefully this is a big improvement on that. Um, this program really results from the advocacy of your legislators, uh, harbor masters like yourself, citizens. Um, we had two information sessions, as uh, Assistant Secretary Vega said, one in Beverly, one in Plymouth, organized by then Secretary um, Jay Ash. And what we learned is obviously dredging has huge needs in the Commonwealth and that coastal harbors up and down the community are really critical to the blue economy and that economy matters at the local level as well as the state level. So when we talk about the blue economy, there's obviously a lot of activities involved in that. We take a very broad definition. We include both like commerce activities, fishery, transportation, but we also include in that the activities that make that commerce possible. So we do take into account public safety, coastal resiliency, all that stuff in the application. Um, it's really a, success, a successor program to a pilot program that the Baker Political Administration launched last year. Uh, we announced 3.6 million in pilot grants, uh, awarded to 10 fully permitted projects that year, announced in August 2018. As Assistant Secretary Vega said, at the same time, the program became a filing in the Economic Development Bond Bill, and that was funded, signed by the governor, which gives us funding for the foreseeable future. So this is the successor program to that. The goals are basically the same. We just added in some lessons that we got from the pilot program, which is why you run a pilot program. <laughs> so the basics, what does the program actually do? It provides construction phase funding for saltwater dredging projects. The key term there is construction phase funding, of course, which we'll get into detail. It's administrated by the Economic um, Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. Uh, it supports the long-term strength and sustainability of your coastal harbors and the blue economy. And what the focus is is shovel-ready projects that contribute to basically four categories that we associate with the blue economy, the economic significance of your harbors, the recreational value, the public safety, and the coastal resiliency that the project is going to provide. I'm a big fan of photos. I think they help <laughs> add some color to it, so you'll see a lot from our pilot projects in there. Um, the basics, who's eligible to apply? Uh, all 78 coastal municipalities, so it does have to be a public entity that is applying from the municipality, and there's one application limit in this grant round, and the applications can be single or joint, so you can either submit a single application or you can sign on to a joint application, but only one of those, you can't submit two. What's eligible for funding, uh, the general is the dredging of public Thailands and the actual disposal of that material. This is a cost reimbursement program, so just realize that we only reimburse for actual work completed. There's no payments provided up front. You provide invoices and we'll pay you back for those. Um, eligible reimbursement costs are for bidding and construction. So pre-construction costs, which we consider studies, design, engineering, permitting, real property transactions, those are not eligible in this program. But you do have the opportunity under some circumstances to claim those as a match. So we'll get into that a little later. 
How much is available? Uh, you can request up to 2.5 million per municipality. So that means if it's a joint application, in theory, each municipality in that could be requesting to the 2.5 million, so you could get higher. Um, we anticipate awarding up to four million for multiple projects, and given how competitive we think it could be and the limited funding, we would consider partial awards, or at least we have that possibility in there. Uh, a non-state match. So like most grant programs, there's a match requirement. It's a 50% non-state match for the total project cost. You can provide multiple non-state funding sources, uh, federal grants, municipal funds, private contributions, and pre-construction costs. There are some limits. The costs have to be incurred within the last three fiscal years, including this fiscal year, in order to count towards your match. So just be aware of that. Um, and we do require documentation of the match prior to contracting. So generally we'll ask it before you sign the contract, but we do have it in the RP that if we have some questions in your application about the fund, we can ask it when reviewing the application. So just be aware of that. Uh, for actual contracting, if you're uh, selected as an awardee, uh, you're required to provide the match documentation and also all permits and drawings. So that's essentially the bid drawing so we can see what's going out to bid. The anticipated start date for the contracts is the next fiscal year because the funds won't be available to us to give out until the next fiscal year. Um, all grants funds must be expended by June 30th, 2020. So like a lot of grant programs, these are capital dollars and they expire after a fiscal year. We're given so many to give out and then those projects have to be completed. Um, so that's why shovel readiness is really important to this program. In measuring shovel readiness, these are the types of things we're looking for. And we'll get into that a bit more in the evaluation, but essentially if you know, uh, if you've done construction projects before, shovel readiness basically means you're fully permitted, your, your design is done, uh, your match funding is secure, and your bidding and construction schedule is realistic because we also realize that dredging has a lot of restrictions on when you can do it. Um, so we're trying to get out as early as possible this year. Hopefully we can even get out earlier next year. Uh, and we're improving on the navigational dredging program because we weren't able to get out to you guys until almost the fall of last year. So we're trying to get out sooner. Come on, don't fail me now. Can you go next slide? All right. So management of the grants. Payments are dispersed up to once a month for actual work completed as documented by your invoices. They don't have to be prepaid. You send the invoices to us. We send you the money. You can provide proof of payment later. So you don't have to worry about that. You are required to provide quarterly performance reports. Some other deliverables. We have to see what the actual plans are you're putting out just so we have a record of the contracts. And you do have to provide a post-dread survey, which you have to provide to your permitting authorities anyway. So it's just sending me a copy because <laughs> inter department loans can take a while. Um, we do keep 5% of the award held as retainage to the contract closeout, so we can provide funding as much as possible, but be aware that that 5% has to stay on hold until the project is actually closed out. Submitting the application, there are two due dates, uh, May 1st, 2019. Since it's electronic submission, you have until midnight. I used to be a grant writer. I wouldn't do that, I have done that many a times, but it kind of sometimes is good to have that. No late submissions will be accepted, no paper, and applications must be typed. Seems pretty straightforward, but not always. How the application is actually organized is very similar to the pilot round. Uh, you have your project summary, basic snapshot of the application. This harbor profile is really the only new section to it. So this is kind of where we tease out what are the actual characteristics and economic significance of your harbor. Just some information about how many moorings, slips, that type of thing, marinas you have in there so we can get a sense of what the type of harbor it is. Uh, the project description is where you give your general need, uh, where you describe your scope, and where we really measure your shovel readiness. So those are your permitting questions, your time of year restrictions, so we can understand that. Uh, budget and funding sources. This is essentially a budget table where you break down how much you're requesting and how much you're matching and from where. Supporting the blue economy, this is by far the largest of the sections. It's kind of divided into four subsections. This is where we're going to ask you, what are the existing conditions in your harbor? How is the, um, the shallowing um, impacting those conditions? And when you complete this project, what are the benefits going to be? And we look at four categories to kind of measure those benefits. Uh, commercial fishing slash boating, uh, recreational boating, 
public safety, and coastal resiliency. So there's kind of a section dedicated to each of those, and each of those will be evaluated kind of equally, and we'll look at all four. It's definitely the largest of the sections. Sometimes you may require communication with stakeholders, that type of thing, so just be aware. Preparing for success. Um, these questions were here in the last one. We just put them into their own section this time. We're basically measuring your capacity to sustain the benefits, what type of local plans you have to show that you think forward about dredging, what types of revenue you collect that could be used for dredging in the future, what types of permitting do you have, how long does that last, and also we wanted to try to grab a measurement which we do for MassWorks and many of our other grants, which is if you have a partnership with someone that has said if you do this dredging project we're going to invest money in one way or another in your harbor you can provide a letter from the private person and claim credit for that and then no signature is required please do not scan and then upload you only have to date the application all right so be aware of that um, required attachments only required attachments really are the permits and permit modifications. In the pilot round, it was such a quick turnaround that CZM, Bob O'Reilly, thank goodness, tracked down a lot of the applications for us. This year, we're asking you to upload them for us so we can get that and we have a better understanding of how shovel ready you are. Um, some other things to think about, these are kind of dependent on the type of application. If it's joint, you have to have a letter of collaboration stating that both municipalities are agreeing onto the application. And this is where if you have a public-private partnership and someone is agreeing to invest money in either commercial boating, fishing, harbor jobs, or additional dredging projects like piggyback dredging, that type of thing, you can provide a letter from the private person and we'll consider that. Um, these are not letters of support. <laughs> That's key, these are from private people in, uh, basically agreeing that they're going to be providing some sort of investment on any letters of support um, would come around optional and really no additional captions are needed. Um, so anything that's provided outside of these isn't gonna be evaluated, but we would say if there's like graphic documents to give us an idea of what the harbor looks like, if you think that's important, you can provide those, just keep them limited. Submitting the application, some of the logistics. Um, basically step-by-step, step, and these are all in the RFP. Um, you gotta go to this webpage and you're actually gonna download the RFP and the application is also there. Please read the RFP in full, not only because I spent a lot of time writing it, but also because it has a lot of information that is very valid when you're applying. Um, the application, I am very sorry for this. Last year we used a PDF document, which are great for forms, but they now expand the boxes, and that resulted in a lot of trouble. I can see other applicants agreeing. So the only way I could solve that was doing a Word document, and unfortunately, when you lock the Word document, it takes spell check away, which for me felt crippling. Um, but just be aware of that. When you fill out the application, spell check is not on, so double check your typing, and and what you often do with these types of grant applications is, I know it doesn't seem that efficient, you can type it in another Word document and paste it later. Um, once you complete that, you're gonna save the application and all your permits, because remember, we want all those permits in a separate file. Name all of them with a brief descriptor, the name of your city or town with that, and then you're gonna upload them right on our website. There's a web form that you click on, and it goes step by step, upload this, upload that. And I'll kind of show you a screenshot of that. Am I going too fast at an okay speed? All right, we're going good, all right. So what's the application actually look like? Again, it's a Word document, and because it's protected, it's gotta feel a little weird because you can't manipulate it like you used to. So whenever you see a gray field, you can type in there, check boxes, and these answer boxes are where you can type your narratives. The good thing about them is they expand automatically, so they get larger and larger, and even the tables will expand for you, so it's hopefully a very user-friendly document, much more than the PDF even was. Um, you can also copy and paste in there, which makes it nice and easy. Submitting the application, once you have all that done, you gotta click on our webpage, like I said, that's on how to apply, and you're gonna get a form that looks like this, which is basically step-by-step -step instructions to upload the files. Um, just be aware that there's no save and come back kind of button. You have to upload everything at once and go page by page. Um, Follow the on-screen instructions. We tried to make them as uh, clear as possible. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is the upload attachment page. You're basically asked to you know, choose a category for the attachment. You can always choose other. 
you actually upload the file here. And there will always be this question, are there additional attachments? Um, because unfortunately with this form, you couldn't upload them all on one page. It has to go attachment by attachment. So we didn't want you to have to go through 15 pages. <laughs> So you can answer yes or no. Yes, you'll go to the next page, upload your next one. If you hit no, you go straight to the end of the page uh, and the end of the application. You can always press previous to go back. So just be aware of that. Uh, nothing is set in stone until you actually submit it. Some helpful tips when you do this, there are no word or character limitations and the boxes do expand. So on some Word documents and PDFs, you can only write so much. We didn't put that in there this time, but please be concise if you can. We don't want 20 page <laughs> narratives for sure. Um, complete all sections. I really can't state that enough. We have those four categories, public safety, coastal resiliency. You may not feel that your project necessarily touches all of those, but please complete the questions because you could be able to make arguments and we can't evaluate what isn't answered. So if you do answer it, we might be able to give you some credit for it. So even if you feel the section doesn't apply, please look at it and complete it in full. And again, uh, no spell check in the application, have to hit that home. And when you write the narrative, some good practice, provide examples, numbers, other data when it's available. So the award decision, um, we'll have an evaluation committee proposed of EOGD staff and also EEA staff. Um, we're basically going to look at the evaluation criteria, which we'll go over in detail. That's the primary way we're evaluating your applications. We tell you exactly what we're looking for. We also do have to consider the amount of funding, how much is available to go around based on what's being requested. And we're also gonna consider the urgency of certain projects. Um, the list is always subject to review by the secretary as well as ratification by the governor and lieutenant governor. And like with all grant applications, we always say that we can take into account the broad and equitable distributions among the communities. Um, you don't have to worry about wondering if your application is going to be approved. Uh, we will notify you in writing, regardless of whether you're chosen or not. And there'll always be opportunities for follow-up. We call them debriefings to provide you specific information on your application and how you can hopefully uh, improve it next year. So the evaluation criteria, this is essentially what we are looking at when we evaluate your application and compare it to everyone else. This is what marks the competitiveness of your application. It's broken down by all the sections and we're gonna consider and weigh all these things. So in the harbor profile section, what we're looking at is the characteristics of your harbor and are they consistent with what e, uh, CZM actually calls a developed harbor. So something with berth areas, lawn tramps, offloading facilities, one or more of those types of things to show its economic significance. We also take into account whether there's a down town or community waterfront in the area, that type of thing. So we're trying to distinguish whether the harbor is primarily residential or whether it also has that downtown community aspect to it. The project description, we're gonna rate the overall strength in that description that you give, the feasibility of the project scope of work. Again, we're looking at projects that have to be done within a year uh, because those funds expire, so we do have to take that into consideration. And the evidence of the shovel readiness, how ready is your project ready to go out to bid. Uh, funding sources, extent to which your pre-construction costs are funded, demonstration of a 50% or greater non-state match, and evidence that the, all, that the match funds are secured or that they're clearly going to be secured by July 1. Supporting the blue economy, again, this is the largest of the sections, so we kind of give information on each of those subcategories. Uh, just be aware, um, Multiple categories are good. It does lead to more competitive application, but you're not required to excel in every category. We're not going to not look at your application because you only hit one, two, three, that type of thing. Um, where everything's gonna be considered for funding and we're trying to weigh all the categories equally. Um, for commercial fishing and boating, it's pretty straightforward. What do you have in your harbor uh, regarding commercial fishing, aquaculture, commercial boating activities? What's that currently like in your harbor? And how is this project going to strengthen those activities? Recreational boating, key phrase here is region-wide boating public. So what we're looking for is does your harbor support regional recreation activities. We're gonna measure that by the lawn trans facility you have, how much parking you have, whether that's available to the general public or just your residents, and also if you have any transient voter accommodations. Those are some factors that weigh in. And then the, just the general strength of the project support 
And again, you can make that argument that the project will support your waterfront activities, the downtown areas, that type of thing. We take that into consideration. Safety, we kind of measure this on two levels. One is what's the risk that groundings are going to happen and how is the project going to improve that risk? The other one is what's the risk right now that your public safety vessels won't be able to reach an accident because of the limitations caused by the shawling. Um, so what we look for is how much are you actually reducing risks and how much are you improving public safety responsiveness in that category. Coastal resiliency, this is kind of a broad category. What we're looking for is the strength of the project support for either preserving, protecting, or restoring coastal resources. We're taking a very broad definition of this. So it could include your beaches, your wetland resources, your water quality, things like that. Um, also, if you can demonstrate how your dredge materials are gonna be used beneficially, please cite that. You don't get penalized if they're not being used beneficially, because obviously sometimes that can happen. Um, and the demonstration of if the project aligns with your municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. Everyone know what MVP plan is? A lot of your communities have probably already done this. It's basically a program offered by EEA under the governor's executive order and it provides funding to communities to basically come up with a plan that looks at your vulnerability to climate change over the long term and you recognize certain goals and objectives to improve your resiliency to those. What we say is that if you can show your project aligns with any of those goals, uh, maybe you're putting beach material in an area that's really good for the coastal resiliency and that was one of the things you identified in your, pro in your plan, that's something we'll take into consideration. If you don't know if you're a community, I actually looked this up, all of, any plan that's actually been created by a municipality is all on the mass.gov website. So you can just search for your municipality and the plan is right down there. So you don't have to search for your planner or try to find a form that sometimes is, who knows, <laughs> in the local level. Um, preparing for success. So again, what we're looking for is the capacity to sustain the benefits of the project. We're gonna look at, do you have a maintenance plan? What do your local planning documents say? What's your revenue sources? And then again, we also give credit, if you can demonstrate that you have a private commitment to invest in some sort of jobs, commercial vessels, or those additional projects. Uh, piggyback dredging projects count, someone that says, if this gets done, we'll finally be able to do our dredging and we'll do it next year. That type of stuff can count, but we do need a letter stating that, just like we do in a lot of other our grant programs like MassWorks. Q&A, so um, Q&A goes through tomorrow at 12 p.m., so if you leave this from today, something pops into your head, you can send an email uh, to our inbox, and as long as it's a general question, um, we'll put it on the list of questions that we can answer. By that, I mean now that we're actively in the RFP stage, we're kind of in a cone of silence. We can only answer general questions and not specific questions regarding a project, such as how to improve your arguments. We can't answer those, but we can answer questions to help you interpret the RFP and understand what's allowable. Um, all questions and answers will be posted right on the website along with this recording so you can go back and check everything else until the date and even though we're not answering questions, please don't feel like if you have difficulty uploading anything, we're going to leave you stranded. We will clearly be at our desk until the close of the business day on that Friday. I can't help you at 11.59 p.m., but at least at the end of that business day, I will be available so don't feel you're left in the lurch. Uh, some final reminders, do read the RFP in full, review the evaluation criteria in detail, the things we just went over because that's really what you're being evaluated on and how you're going to make your application competitive. Uh, some of the sections may require conversation with stakeholders, so don't leave those sections to the last day because <laughs> you may need help understanding how many jobs there are, how many even marinas, that type of thing. And the awards must be expended in fiscal year 2020. So really think about it. This is a project you can complete in one year. If so, are there phases of the project that you can complete and still be competitive in that application?